and now we just have history and we know that in about 70 AD is the revolt and the Romans come in and they just, it was ugly what happened to the Jewish people in 70 AD. That's where the temple was then destroyed um, and has never been rebuilt. So, um, well, let, let me back up a little bit. So Zerubbabel came and rebuilt the temple. That's the second temple. When Herod the Great came along about 400 years later, he, some call that the third temple, but most people say it's the, it's the second temple. He just greatly expanded it. And you will see the stones that Herod used to expand the second temple, or some want to call it the third temple. So that's where sacrifices were made from the time of Solomon until the time of the exile. They come back, they rebuild, sacrifices start again. Sacrifices happen throughout the life of Jesus until 70 AD. And since then, the temple has been destroyed. It has never been rebuilt no sacrifices. Have you ever wondered why did, why did they do sacrifice in the Old Testament and Orthodox Jews don't do them now? They want to, but there's only one place they're allowed to and they don't have access to it. Uh, only the Muslims do. So they want it back. In fact, the Jewish people are preparing all the instruments they would need to do sacrifices once again. Um, there's a museum that has some of those. Uh, so that's, that's the temple. So strangely enough, you're up here three times a year, you're going all the way down to Jerusalem. It's gonna take you a week. You do it three times a year, you takes maybe up to a week to get down there, you're there for seven days, takes a week to get back. Three weeks, three times a year, nine weeks, you're traveling. Then if at other times you want to offer a sacrifice or you need to because of the law of Moses, you're doing it down there. You are not offering a sacrifice here. That's the difference between a temple uh, the temple, not a temple, the temple and a synagogue. Synagogues were all over the place. If there's a gathering of Jewish people, they built a synagogue. So if you're traveling in Europe and you go to a town, you go to, if some of you remember the series I did uh, from Corinth, there's a synagogue there. Um, you go to any town, uh, historically, that has a gathering of Jewish people, they will build a synagogue. So that's the temple and synagogue. Makes sense for everyone? Now, the purpose of the synagogue. The purpose of this synagogue, I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, is this is about fourth century synagogue. It's not the first century, but typically, um, uh, two things. You'd build new synagogues on top of old synagogues. Anyone want to guess which way Jerusalem is? They're going to orient it this way. So Jerusalem's going to be that way. Um, now, <clears throat> they would use this for schools. Uh, children would be taught here. This would be for the Jewish people. This would be the courthouse. You have a legal issue. It could be done here. Uh, town council meetings, meetings, even meals. This was done, so don't think like a church building, like, oh, we're going to church. It's time for a church service and then maybe some other things. This was used for all kinds of environments. But the ultimate purpose of this was for the reading and teaching of uh, the Torah and of the prophets. Okay, follow me so far. Okay, now what's interesting is that when it comes to a synagogue, um, this was the place that people would come to hear teachers teach. So we already read that Jesus would go from synagogue to synagogue. Uh, why? Because that's the place you would go to hear the law and the prophets taught. Paul did the very same thing. So if you're in Acts, can we just, let's fly through the book of Acts. Let me show you some things. I think you'll find this very interesting and I'll, I'll bring up why it matters to us here. Acts chapter 13. Look at verse. Um, look at verse four. The two of them. This is Saul and Barnabas. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. That's where you would go to do it. And it's kind of strange, right? Because are Jews followers of Jesus? No. But if you're a teacher, if, if you're a Jewish teacher, come to the synagogue and instruct. So it's kind of funny, but it's, it's amazing. You go to the place that they are waiting for the Messiah, and what do you proclaim? He came. He's come. Follow him. And this happened over and over again, which means they often didn't stay in synagogues very long. Uh, so look, in fact, look down to verse 48 of chapter 13. Um, Later in this city, we read, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, those who were appointed for eternal life, 
believed. That all started in the synagogue. Look at chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. This was their pattern. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. By the way, I love a phrase in verse 1. They spoke so effectively. Um, I, used to, I, I used to teach preaching classes, and I still I lead lead pastor coaching networks. At the end of February, I'll have 12 pastors, senior pastors from around the country that will come to Houston. We'll spend a lot of time talking about preaching, and one of my pet peeves is when pastors say, I preach the word, and that's all I can do. Well, no, apparently you're supposed to do it so effectively that people come to faith in Christ. Mm. And if people aren't coming to faith in Christ through your preaching, maybe don't blame the Holy Spirit. That's a whole other topic. Okay. Um, verse 2. But the Jews refused to believe. Uh, they stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Uh, let's jump ahead. Let's go three chapters ahead. Let's go to 17. Verse 1. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphilopolis, I don't know how to say this, and Apollyona, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue, as was his custom. Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving the Messiah had to suffer and die and then rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he says. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Um, just fascinating. Uh, let's see, let's go to... How about verse 10? As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas, because they had to sneak them away, away to Berea. On arriving there, where'd they go? The Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were more noble character than those of Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures. By the way, just a real quick comment here. That's why I want to be Christians of grace. We are saying we want to follow the truth wherever it leads. The point here was one was rejecting the Messiah because they believed the Messiah hadn't come yet. Forget evidence. We don't believe the Messiah has come. Berean Jews were, were more honest because they were saying, show us the truth. We want to find out what the truth is. Uh, let's see. Let's go to chapter 17. Or I'm in 17, aren't we? Go down to verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue. He started in the synagogue, uh, and then he gets invited to the Areopagus. Uh, so you can, you can go to Athens today, and you can see the synagogue. Then you can go to the Areopagus, this uh, outcropping of rocks where Paul preaches. Um, let's see here. Let's go to chapter 18. I'm just going to show you one or two more things, and then I'll get to the point of why I wanted to be here. Look at verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. Because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Gentiles were welcomed into synagogues. It's not a Jews only thing. It's not a temple. Uh, this, is, this is for anyone to come and listen. That's kind of, that's how it happened. Um, Chapter 19. Let, let me maybe one or two more that I like. Chapter 19, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. Eventually, verse 10, for two years he teaches in this lecture hall um, so that all Jews and Greeks who lived heard the word of the Lord. He's at a, a crossroads there. Again, God uses the crossroads. All right, I'm going to show you one final place in the book of Acts. Go to chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 19. Lord, I reply, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believed in you. So Paul is now sharing his story. He's, this, he's sharing the story of his conversion on the road to Damascus, where we talked about that yesterday up at the Golan Heights. And he's saying, how would he find Christians? He would go to synagogues. Mm -hmm. That's where he'd find the followers of Jesus, because they would go there to pursue their, to persuade their fellow Jews that this is, this is the Messiah you've been waiting for. Um, so synagogues are throughout the book of Acts. So when you think synagogue, whenever you read this, think this. And after lunch, we're going to go see another one from one century later, from the fifth century. But this is the idea. You'd sit along the edges for the teaching. Um, 
men on one side, women on the other. Um, and there's a lot that we don't know about synagogues, um, but a lot that we do from either the Bible or from history and how it worked. Uh, and by the way, turn to Luke 4. I want to show you a passage about a synagogue there. Um, here's what we do know, putting it together from the Bible and other sources. Every synagogue had a leader in charge of the whole operation. Um, then there were teachers called rabbis. Some of these rabbis were traveling rabbis that would go, when you'd show up, here's a, here's a guest rabbi, and they would be allowed to speak. There also was an attendant, and the attendant's job was to serve the rabbi or serve the leader of the synagogue in whatever way they needed. One of their particular jobs was to take care of the scrolls. You have a copy of the scriptures on your phone. You probably have seven translations on your phone. Um, it used to be that people just had the hand copy of the scriptures. Many of you have those, but that's, that's a recent phenomenon. We talk about the invention of the printing press changing everything. Before that, you had to gather somewhere to hear the Bible taught as it was handwritten. And um, each synagogue would have a handwritten copy of the law and the prophets, and it was protected ferociously. And um, in fact, one of the um, one of the most uh, terrible things to see in um, in a Holocaust museum is when they would go into synagogues and destroy them. I, I know the one in D.C. has um, pieces of destroyed synagogues that the Germans would go into their town. It's just uh, and even be willing to destroy their scrolls, the, the sacred scriptures they would have um, in their synagogues. But, the, but in this day, they'd have scrolls. We don't know how exactly they were stored in a closet, in some kind of cupboard. We don't know. But the rabbi, is time for the teaching. Men on one side, women on the other. And the teacher would um, be called to the front, and the attendant would. It was a very sacred thing. Uh, how many of you have, have uh, uh, you've been to a church where they follow some kind of lectionary? You know, maybe a Catholic church or, okay, so some, a few of you that basically, here's the reading of the day, you read this from the Old Testament, you read this from the New Testament, more liturgical church. Well, that's how the synagogue was. There was the, an assigned reading. The attendant would bring out the proper scroll. <laughs> the, the whole Old Testament is not in one scroll. He'd bring out the right scroll for the reading of the day, hand it to the rabbi. The rabbi would read it, and then the rabbi, then this, this is different in your church you attend, your pastor stands up to teach. But the rabbi then would read the scroll, hand it back to the attendant. Then the teacher, the rabbi, would sit down, and he would instruct the people from what he read. And that's how it would happen. Now, where would he sit down? He would sit down right there. That is called Moses' seat, or the seat of Moses. In fact, that one right there is a replica. They do an amazing job with replicas. You are going to be able to see in a few days in the Israel Museum the actual seat of Moses they found here. There was one at the um, at Magdala we saw from the first century. It wasn't in this good of shape. Um, but there was a seat of Moses. This is the seat of authority. A rabbi teaches from the seat. He's going to teach us about the law and the prophets, and we would listen. Okay, understand the context of how that all happened? Okay, based on that, very quickly, let me read this passage of Scripture as we have another group coming in. Oh, and by the way, let me reference this first. Matthew 23, 2 says this. Jesus says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And then basically says, but they're hypocrites. Mm. They want you to do what they say, but not what they do. So when Jesus says, the, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, they're rabbis, they're instructors. If you wonder, what in the world does that mean? It's that right there, mm. Moses' seat. So, Luke 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So Jesus is back up here after his time in the wilderness, down south, where we'll look. We'll see some of that tomorrow. And he's one of these traveling rabbis. He would come, and he would teach. And he's a popular rabbi. Verse 15, everyone praised him. Very popular rabbi. Verse 16, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. So this story did not happen in Chorazin. I'm just bringing you here because we can see a Moses, we can see a seat of Moses, we're in a synagogue. Um, so this is, I don't know, how far away do we think Nazareth is from here, Mickey, would you say? A day walk. Okay, so a day away from here walking, you're in Nazareth, in the synagogue, that's where this story took place. Jesus returned to Galilee, news about him spread through the whole countryside. So that means people are gathering. 
He was teaching in their synagogues. Everyone praised him. Verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. So when Jesus is living this ministry life, every Saturday, Sabbath, he's going to the synagogue and instructing. It's his custom. Now he's in Nazareth. It's, Sab it's the Sabbath. So he went to the synagogue. He stood up to read. So this wasn't something Jesus did on occasion. Every Sabbath he does this, local synagogue. At the end of verse 16, he stood up to read. So the attendant hands Jesus the scroll from which he's assigned to read from that day. Men sitting on one side, women sitting on the other, and watch what happens next. Verse 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. So why that scroll? That's the scroll of the day by chance. That's sarcastic. <laughs> it, so here we go verse 17 b unrolling it he found the place it was written so it seems like he's God, was he given the whole scroll of isaiah perhaps he said i know where i want to read <laughs> here's what he reads verse 18 the spirit of the lord is on me because he's appointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the lord's favor he is, he is reading Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, which is about the promised Messiah. Little time out, those who were in Machaerus, when Jesus talked, uh, when his disciples came to see him, when John's disciples came to see him up in Galilee, are you the one who's to come or should we look for someone else? He quotes Isaiah 61, but he left out setting the prisoners free. Interesting. Okay, so. G here's, here's what he reads again. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. That's what it says. Jesus has not yet applied it to himself, but Jesus is reading, a pa the Messiah is reading a passage about the Messiah, about what the Messiah says. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to claim freedom for prisoners, recover his sight for the blind, and set the oppressed free. And I'm imagining the Jewish people, they love that passage. Yes, we can't wait for that day. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. So where did he sit? Right there. there. So perhaps you've read that and thought, oh, he went back to his seat. Because the next verse says all the eyes were on him. Of course all the eyes are on him. He's sitting in the teacher's seat. Oh, what are you going to tell us about the coming Messiah? We can't wait to hear it. Well, that changed pretty quickly. Hmm. The middle of the verse, 20. The eyes of everyone on the synagogue were fastened on him. Verse 21. He began by saying, today the scripture is fulfilled in your this is an amazing moment because for hundreds of years people have read this verse the spirit of the lord is is on me and he's anointed me too people rabbis have read that verse for years they never were talking about themselves they were talking about the coming messiah then jesus reads the spirit of the lord is on me and he's saying i'm talking about me not some coming messiah okay watch what happens next Verse 22, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? So Jesus probably went on because that, that would be a pretty short sermonette. He probably explained that a little bit. And the people were initially impressed. Um, they're saying, what a nice young man. Isn't this Joseph's son? Um, isn't this, uh, his parents have to be proud. You know, it's, it's nice. They're patting him on the back. So Jesus makes it a little more clear. Verse 23. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we heard you did in Capernaum. So he's saying, you're proud of me now, one day soon you'll be mocking me, and it probably got pretty tense and quiet in the synagogue, and now he goes after them, verse 24, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown, so he's saying, you don't accept me for who I am, stop your nice words about me, stop patting me on the head, you don't get it yet. Verse 25, I assure you there will be many widows, that there were many widows in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. We talked a lot about that. If you aren't familiar with the story, you can read it in 1 Kings 17. There's a famine. Elijah, God sent Elijah to one specific widow, and that widow was not a Jew. In other words, he's saying to them, the day will come where you won't accept me, so I'll go to non-Jewish people instead. That is offensive to these people. He's not done. Verse 27, second story. 
And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet one, not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Different prophet, Elisha, not Elijah, same theme. Many people in Israel had diseases, but God had Elisha heal one person. Naaman, a Syrian, not a Jew. What's the point? Jesus is saying, if you don't respond to the message, then the message will be sent to non-Jewish people. And to them, that was offensive, that was insulting. And uh, I'm sure they're thinking, we invite you to speak in our synagogue, you read this passage, you declare yourself to be the, the Messiah, we ignored you, we patted you on the head, and you came after us. Verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. If they didn't get what Jesus was claiming in verse 21, they get it now. Jesus is saying, I'm not just a prophet from God, I'm the Messiah. And if you don't accept me, this message will be sent to the Gentiles. Who do you think you are? They're furious. Here's what they did. Verse 29, they got up, they drove him out of town. They took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. What happened? They got him up. Where is Jesus? He's sitting on Moses' seat. This is a place of respect. They pull him off the seat. They take him to the highest mountain in, in Nazareth. It's now called uh, Mount Precipice. Uh, you can go there. Uh, in fact, the five people that were here with Northridge, four people, they went there. Uh, two days ago um, and they're gonna throw him off why why do they want to kill him because he just blasphemed he declared himself to be the Messiah that's a death sentence and the synagogue decided they were gonna carry out the death sentence on their own verse 30 but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way so Jesus performs a miracle they're mad they're angry everything stops he walks and goes on his way yeah. it's just awesome this was the first time they tried to kill him it would not be the last. This time they were unsuccessful. Eventually they will succeed. And that happened through a seed of Moses. Now we read about the seed of Moses. When you read about that, here's what I think. When God spoke, eventually they wanted to kill him. I think Americans don't want to kill God. They just want to ignore him. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to be very clear. This is who I am. Make a choice. And they did. They just chose poorly. Uh, that's, but that's a synagogue. That's what happened here. And what's so cool about a synagogue, we tend to think, oh, that's where the Jew, Jews gathered. But in the first century, this is where Christians would gather to persuade the Jews, embrace him as the Messiah, embrace him as the Messiah. It's a reminder again that Christians did not choose to separate themselves from their culture. They went into the middle of the culture to be at the place that most effectively, and really they're, they're thinking strategically. Let's go to a place that people are looking for a Messiah, they're God-fearing people, and let's share with them the Evangelion, the good news, the gospel, the Messiah has come. And uh, Jesus made the self-proclamation. In fact, it's interesting, there are people who try to say Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, he clearly did, and this is about as clear as you can get. You sit in the seat of Moses reading about a Messiah who quotes that the God that the good news has come to me, the Lord has said to he's anointed me, and Jesus says, that just happened. So it's kind of a cool environment, it's kind of a cool place, cool story that happened not too far from here. Comments, questions about that story? So I encourage you, you can get a picture of Moses' seat here. You also could, you'll get a chance to do it at the Israel Museum in a few days. Um, but here you at least get it in context, but you're going to have a water bottle on top yeah. of it. So. Good place for that. And, and, and you probably, if we take too many pictures, you know, yeah, just be cautious. Okay, so um, I want to give you a chance to walk around, take some photos, make anything else that we want to talk about here. Let's, uh, let's pick a time. There's, there is plenty of other things to look at.